Dust to Dust. It is an amazing book. It is an amazing uh, memoir. It's one of those I can't put it down books. So um, Ben has some books tonight that he'll be signing if you'd like to purchase one of them. And you don't want to hear me talk anymore, so let me introduce Benjamin Bush. Thanks. Thanks so much. <clears throat> Hey everybody, uh, I wore the official's author's uniform, which is of course corduroy, <laughs> and uh, I will take it off at some point because it, it's really warm, <laughs> but I like to be in uniform initi initially before I get into uh, the full throw, and I brought this, which makes me focus, <laughs> and I believe everything that I read when it's advertising, so I know that I'm going to be sharp tonight. Uh, thanks so much for coming out in support of, uh, you know, the arts, first of all, but uh, this library has become quite a cultural center. I got a tour of it, and I've never seen a place like this. You know, I, I almost feel like I could kind of go to college here and never leave the building. You know, it's got everything from, <laughs> from childhood to adulthood taken care of. So it's a great place, and I'm, I'm glad you're all using it as a, as a place to be. Um, so, dust to dust. Um, I, I had come back, and I kind of feel like I repeat myself because I have to kind of tell the story over and over again. but. I came back from a, uh, a very rough tour in Ramadi in 2005, got home on my daughter's first birthday, who didn't know who I was, and within a year lost both my parents. So it was a period of incredible transition, uh, kind of dealing with just about too much loss all at once, um, to the point of disbelief in any of it. And uh, that's kind of one of those things that you, you discover is that in, in memory, you're able to assign immortality to people you love, right? And at the same time, uh, you have these memories which are built over, over a life. Uh, as a child, you have certain beliefs which you preserve despite the fact that you've moved on and become an adult. Things like, my parents are immortal to me and I'm invulnerable. Those are the childhood things. If you have a great childhood, um, those are the things you kind of believe, right? Um, the, there, are, there are these untouchable, permanent things in your life. You are one of them, your parents are the other. And then over time you realize, of course, uh, immortality is harder than it looks, uh, although I've still got a plan. <laughs> I'm still working on it. As you can see, it's working so far. But um, I'm way behind on my pyramid construction. So if you guys like rock, come out to Michigan. I'll start soon. Um, and as I was uh, dealing with all this, I kind of, the, the place that I could find my parents after they were gone was memory. And I, I, had, I had not paid enough attention to its power. I had not uh, given enough credit to the library that we all carried. And when my father died, he died first. <coughs> and um, my mother was still alive. So I was able to disbelieve his death because she still carried all the stories he knew, most of them. And he also she also carried my story. You know, she was there for my first steps. I was there, but I don't quite remember that period so well. Uh, so those stories were resident in one living person in the world. And because of that, everything that they were associated with hadn't been destroyed. And then she died. Of all things, brain cancer, the place where you remember, right? And I disbelieved her death all the way to the end because I didn't want it to be possible. Because the different layers came out in me, even though I know that that mortality is inevitable. Uh, the memories, I, the thoughts I had as a child were still laid underneath the foundations of our reality, which is that these things will happen. And the child refused to believe in them. And I could feel it in myself. My own childhood was saying, this is not possible, while the adult in me was saying, yes, it really is. And the two of us never agreed. And I still don't, actually. I still haven't reconciled that because I still have the child in me who still has these beliefs. And so I tried to put this in order, some kind of a sense of how we remember, which is not in order. It moves by association, right? When you think of something in your life, uh, like for my mother, it's daffodils, because she always planted daffodils, and they come up every year, and it's my mother returning to me, right? Um, when I see them, though, I will think of different times in my life, not in chronological order. These things will just arrive to me. The same thing will happen when I, when I think about anything. I'll, I'll move through memory by way of association it has nothing to do with time. It's usually based around an object or, uh, or a place. And so I began to build this book from fragments, which is kind of how I see the world, right? How we all see the world. 
and I hung them all up around me. And I, I, when I was making the book, I was talking earlier in a poetry class, um, I was supposed to finish insulating the cellar when I was finishing this book. And so I had these four by eight sheets of pink extruded uh, foam insulation, which are hideous in every kind of way. And I stood them up, one on each side and two in the front, and I had this rickety lamp and an old table, which was my mother's actual childhood table, and an uncomfortable chair because Marines, if they're comfortable, you begin to slip, you know. So I, I, made, I made sure that it was awkward and unfortunate in every way. And there's just a pile of notes on the table. And I began to tack up the book. And it was like being inside of a womb, you know. It's like this light and this pink space with little fragments of my life and I began to pick the pieces which were strongest, which had a relationship through the chapters. And that's how Dust to Dust came together. So each chapter begins in childhood and goes to adulthood, and then starts again, the next chapter, on another theme. Um, water, metal, bone, and blood. Um, and you kind of have to earn the last two chapters. Uh, blood and ash are the last ones. As you can tell, um, they're heavy subjects. So. I'm just going to read a few pieces throughout the book. Um, I'll start off with, with kind of how an echo works. You know, for me, it seems like some of these, these vignettes or incidents or moments are you know, kind of surprising in their occurrence. Like, why would you write about that at this point in the book? And then eight chapters later, you'll find out why I wrote that part in the book. Um, so this is, uh, I was actually privileged enough, my father was, a, was an English professor which would make sense, right? Hereditary entitlement. Uh, but I was not a reader or a writer because I was digging holes and sharpening sticks. And I was a stonemason trying to build permanent things in the world uh, to keep the world alive um, for me as I respected you know, castles and temples. Everything was built of stone. And I wanted to believe in the permanence of these subjects, right? The, we mark our graves with stones, right? Um, and I get to Kuwait and of course there's sand blowing past. And even though I should know better, it's kind of the first time I was like, ah, those are mountains. And they're going to be mountains again. And I can't sign the sand. I am a brief part of all of this universe. And then I immediately disbelieved it. <laughs> because that's how we survive these things, right? Um, but I became a stonemason because that was the uh, material of perpetuity. And I wanted to work in something which would outlast me. Even if no one ever knew that that was the wall I built, I did. So I'm in school in England. Uh, my father took a sh uh, study group abroad. He was a Dickens specialist. <coughs> and I got to go to England where I thought I was going to be able to figure out the path to knighthood, because that's where they were. And I got there and I found out the Beatles were knights. I'm like, uh, this is not exactly what I had thought. You know, I, was, I grew up with, um, with Arthur stories. And um, I was in school where they, they studied Roman Britain, and they studied it seriously. You know, we're all kids. We're little kids. And they were, we were studying B Queen Boudicca, who was a Celtic leader of the Ancini tribe, who rose up against the Romans. And they lost terribly, <laughs> but they fought them. And so, of course, the Brits uh, we're, uh, we're doing a huge play about this. <clears throat> and in America, you know, we kind of dress up in pumpkin outfits and bounce off each other on stage, and that's a drama for us when we're young and great. In England, they're serious. People dressed up in the part, had lines, had to emote, had to act, were actually directed. Everyone was all involved in drama in England at the time. I was not prepared for this as an American as a colonist. And so um, I was ill-equipped to be there. This, is, this kind of begins, it's in the, the first chapter called Arms. <clears throat> so this is, here we are. I attended school there, and my class spent a year studying Roman Britain. The teachers organized a play about Queen Boudicca, an early Celtic leader of the Ancini tribe, who fought heroically against Roman control in Britain. We could either be legionaries or Celts. I wanted to be in the Legion, but I was cast as one of Boudicca's warriors. We were referred to as barbarians, not Celts, taking on the name given to unruly peoples north of Rome, and we were considered a horde instead of an army. It seemed yet another step down. 
We were sent home with a long list of things to make and instructions on how to dress for the play. I showed the requirements to my father, who looked at them as if he couldn't read, and handed them to my mother. Shield, sword, belt, dark cloak. To make a shield, she gave me a large piece of cardboard from a grocery box, and we covered up the tomatoes printed on it with glue and brown butcher's paper. I said a warrior, barbarian or not, would never emblazon his shield with vegetables. <laughs> Some of the children came in elaborate armor that looked like accurate replicas of Roman uniforms. Their parents had spent weeks working on them, and the children were afraid to move much for fear of tearing something that had been carefully glued. The barbarians ranged in their interpretation, and we looked somewhat like a horde. The teachers had built an impressive wooden chariot as well as two matching horse costumes with paper mache heads and brown cloth bodies, each worn over two men. Half blind, they pulled the chariot around the room with the girl who played the queen standing on it, and we followed. We rehearsed for days. My, my part consisted of nothing more than following Boudicca's chariot into the room, chanting angry nonsense, waving my embarrassing sword, lining up against the Romans, and then charging to my dramatic death. On the day of the performance for a hundred parents, the staff, and several hundred students, we dressed in our classroom, and the Romans marched into the auditorium. The legion stood shoulder to shoulder at the edge of the stage. They looked wonderfully imperial. But I was relieved not to have been chosen for Rome. I could imagine how my armor would have looked if I had been left to craft it from a tomato box. We assembled in the hall outside while speeches were made inside. At some point, we were given a signal and made our entrance. My parents said, as we came in yelling, I was the barbarian most noticeably smiling. <laughs> Boudicca gave her speech about liberty, and then we were to attack the Roman ranks, failing to achieve our freedom. I rushed up the steps at a boy wearing imposing leather Roman armor, and he made an uncomfortable slash at me. This was my cue to perish. <laughs> In rehearsals, I'd gone through the motions, pretending slowly to pretend, but this was the performance. I threw myself backward with a scream, my feet coming off the stage, sword and shield tossed into the air, and I struck the oak floor on my back with a smack that sounded loud, even to me. I was told afterward that half of the parents stood up, and the play went silent with a gasp. I lay unmoving, arms extended, eyes closed, laboring to control my breath. A teacher hurried to my side and stooped, trying very hard not to let her voice sound hysterical. Can you hear me, dear? She asked, her hand on my chest. It was cold. Yes, I hissed, trying not to move my lips. Are you hurt, sweetie? Can you move? <laughs> I've been killed, I whispered, <laughs> keeping my eyes closed. The teacher withdrew. I heard my mother's voice in consultation with her, and the play went on. More boys falling carefully on the floor at the flooded stage to the constrained sword strokes of boys dressed too well for fighting. Queen Boudicca, seeing all of her men killed, made her speech, drank poison, slumped in her chariot, and was pulled out of the room by the teachers dressed as horses. <laughs> I had pretended at war again and had again been killed in front of my parents. It was my first memorable public performance and a blend of the two professions I would go on to, pr to pursue most seriously. Now this is after I talk about the fact that I spent my entire youth being killed behind my parents' house while my father or mother watched out of the kitchen window <laughs> because I wasn't allowed to have a gun because they were Vietnam War protesters and they'd be damned if they were going to raise a soldier. <laughs> but of course, the child will be what he is. <laughs> and I kept on, I, and, I, and I, I stayed with that, but I, I would always still guard my fort with a maple stick sword and be killed by everyone with a gun. So I was constantly dying heroically in my surrounding of rocks against the entire neighborhood shooting at me. <coughs> and I never stopped to think about what that meant for my parents who were watching me die ritually. Because I never won that. I kind, of, I, I kind of gave credibility to the fact that I couldn't win that. So even in a child's irreality, I never won, you know? And then there was, then there was this. It was just more, more of me with, th with that. And I'll push ahead and show kind of how the book works. Um, after my first tour uh, as a young lieutenant, 
described as an intense lieutenant at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Um, I was trying to get into filmmaking, which I'd always wanted to do since the flight back from England. Just before that, I'd seen Star Wars, which blew my mind. I was the last American to see Star Wars, by the way. <laughs> it took a year to get to England, first of all, where everyone in America had seen it four times. I had all the collector's cards because all the British had already seen it as well, and my parents didn't go to movies. So I had these images of Darth Vader and stormtroopers and things. I'm like, you know, <laughs> I really think I need to see whatever this is. <laughs> and uh, we went, and then it ruined me forever. I, I wrote a sign that I put on my door as soon as I came back, which said, movie maker, do not disturb. <laughs> I still screwed up my D's and B's. And uh, my parents saved it. And, and they also saved my first script, which I wrote on the plane home after seeing Star Wars, which is exactly Star Wars, <laughs> with, with like different names and slightly different spaceships drawn. Uh, but it's the same damn thing. Um, so this is pushing ahead now. I've gone to Vassar College, which of course, uh, I was a studio art major at Vassar, studying print mostly, photography, um, sculpture, and a little bit of filmmaking. And uh, like all studio art majors from Vassar, I joined the Marine Corps Infantry. Um, <laughs> you, know, you don't know a lot about the Marine Corps. Uh, we're a fascinating bunch. But uh, after a three-year tour down at, Lej at uh, Lejeune, uh, I went, we moved to College Park where my wife was getting her PhD in Russian history. And um, I tried to make a run it with no contacts in the industry and no schooling, um, just being an actor and making films. So this is how it went for me. <laughs> After a three-year tour at Camp Lejeune in the infantry, my wife and I moved into a little house in College Park, Maryland, our first home together. I had wanted to audition for Homicide, Life on the Street, because it was a good television show and it was filmed in Baltimore, only 30 minutes from our house. It was, in fact, the only local show at the time, and it was probably the only chance I had at a significant role. I would given my headshots to the casting agent months before, and I was called in to play an extra. They said nothing more than that I would need to wear shorts and bring slippers and a bathrobe. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of part is this? I arrived on set excited to be in the middle of the production, and a production assistant boarded me onto a van to go to the hair and makeup trailer. I was informed that I was to play a corpse, which was disappointing. I sat shirtless as my death was applied to me. I was covered with a pale paste where they thought I would be seen in a partially unzipped body bag, and a large hatchet wound was sculpted onto my forehead with wax and opaque shades of blood paints. It was an impressive wound. I dressed in my bathrobe and slippers, got in another van, and was driven a block to the set. In a small warehouse separated from the Baltimore Harbor by a dock where the water ride stopped was a morgue. It had been built for the show, which often brought its detectives there to examine the fictitious dead. There were extras milling around in lab coats and film crews setting up the room for the shoot. I was directed to a stainless steel table, and I carefully slid into the body bag. Even though the room was heated, the table was still cold. Another extra sat beside me with a pad, as if taking notes of what can only be the most obvious cause of death in history. <laughs> a hatchet wound on my forehead. I don't know how he died. As I lay there, I did not participate in the bored banter with other insignificant players and corpses. I wanted to be noted as professional and focused. <laughs> I heard the actors speak their lines for camera tests while I kept my eyes closed. Then stand-in stepped in as lighting was adjusted and the actors rested or continued rehearsing elsewhere. I remained on the table. I did not speak. I waited as the actors were brought back and filming began. I held my breath and controlled my instinct to shiver until they called cut. If anyone had seen me, they would believe that I was not alive. <laughs> they began to shuttle people away for lunch, which was set up somewhere down the street, and the actors disappeared along with the crew. I lay on the table. <laughs> I had no intention of moving until directed to do so. The set lights clicked off and the warehouse grew quiet. <laughs> I could hear footsteps in the back and things being moved, but the set was abandoned. I sat up in the body bag. I was alone. I had not followed the herd out of the building to wait for rides and had been left behind. It occurred to me that no one was going to direct me anywhere. 
I slipped out of the bag and off the table, walked backstage, found my bathrobe and slippers and walked outside. It was December in Baltimore. <laughs> Bitter cold. And I didn't know the area very well. A member of the crew was walking back with a plate and I asked if there was a shuttle coming. He seemed surprised to see me and gave directions to the church where the catering was laid out. I would have to walk. I began to head up the street in my bathrobe and slippers, my bare legs feeling strange as the cold wind struck them. I felt remarkably exposed. I walked across Thames Street where people were Christmas shopping and felt myself being noticed. <laughs> I smiled at couples as they stared, unsure of what they thought they were witnessing. I'd forgotten how my head must have looked. There were many homeless people stumbling around Baltimore, mad with drugs or savage with long disregard. I could have been one of them, insane with imaginary heat in the chill of winter. I arrived at the church where the vans were parked and went in the front entrance. As I stepped through the large wooden doors, I looked directly into a classroom of black children who promptly went silent. <laughs> it took me a moment to see that lunch was downstairs in the church basement. I stood blanched, a gaping wound on my forehead in a bathroom, in a bathrobe. The children stared as a dead white man descended the stairs <laughs> and joined the rest of the damned beneath the church. After we ate, the shuttle returned us to set where I lay back on the table and they finished the scene. Afterward, hair and makeup was busy, so they just gave me some wipes designed for removing makeup and I dressed in my regular clothes. I drove home with the makeup on. I stopped at a 7-Eleven near our house and bought a soda. A Pakistani clerk gave me my change and pretended not to notice that I had been killed. He was very polite. At home, I looked at myself in the mirror. It was good work. The split skin on my forehead, the drained color of my face. I began to wash it off in the sink, my skin red with rubbing and the wax wound shaved off with a butter knife. I was alive again. Later, I watched the episode, eager to see my performance as a dead man. I appeared briefly in the background, out of focus, unrecognizable, my wound unnoticeable, and all the attention paid to details surrounding me were impossible to see. I was, as the dead are, blurred, transformed, faded. A year later, I was called in to audition for a serial killer and returned to the set in Baltimore. In the series finale, in winter again, I was killed, the last homicide on the show, and I lay for hours in a red pool of syrup, my hair actually frozen to the sidewalk. <laughs> I lay there in between takes as crew piled blankets on me. I wanted to be a professional. I didn't complain and I didn't move. I held my breath while they rolled the film. When the episode aired, my parents said that they couldn't watch. <laughs> um, so you see the echo is forming. Uh, this is what I do. Welcome to my book, Dust to Dust. Um, I'll break this up so it doesn't seem like I'm just doing the work for you. You can read this book on your own. <laughs> um, are there any questions so far that I could go off on large, no, unstructured discussions about? Very much the, the beginning actor working. My son Jason had a brief time out in California and worked on the uh, set, and the same exact thing happened. He said, Mom, he, he would always call me in the middle of the night because we didn't worry about the difference of hours. And, Mom, you have to watch. I'm going to be on this show. And I was right next to him because he looked like a body double. Of pause, 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 right. pause, pause. And he Date was there. exactly <laughs> right next to where all the action was, although he kept getting the water splashed in his face constantly at the, in the bar scene. So then the night, I said, well, Jason, I've invited all these people over to see you. He says, tell him I'm the one right next to that guy off the screen. So, <laughs> and that's nice. exactly what I did to all my friends, I have to admit. I, I could really relive what you and your parents went through on your first Yeah, shot. It was, it's so hard to get in slightly. You know, My first, my first actual break-in scene was on a, a show called Michael Hayes, U.S. Attorney, which was in L.A., and it was David Caruso's big return after he had uh, embarrassed himself by leaving television, which he was good to, too good for, to go on and not star in anything. Uh, and then he, they remade a whole show for him 
but no one could stand him, so they canceled it after a year. But it was my first role, and it, uh, they cut my scene. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't yes. know yeah. until the night I had everyone there. Like, yeah. <laughs> but of course, you got paid, and you got to go to the food truck or whatever. You know, those are the yes, things. I got to go to the food truck and have yes, carrots. The only good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Life was awesome. <laughs> Did your mom ever forgive you for joining the Marines? Uh, you know, they, they, um, they always respected who I was. And I think, you know, in this book you see that I, I ran wild in, through the neighborhood of, of the wilderness that I lived in. I lived in a small upstate New York town, which had a river running through it, maybe 90 houses in it. And I left every morning with an apple and a hatchet or an apple and a, foot, and, a, uh, and, a, and a fishing rod. And somehow I came back in the end of the evening, you know, to get dinner. They, <laughs> they just assumed somehow, like I did, that I would make it through the day, even though it was pretty clear I was out pressing some limits, you know. Um, you know, sometimes I'd come back with, you know, I wasn't supposed to go in the river, <laughs> come back with those wet jeans, you know, like all the way up. <laughs> and my father would sit in the, always, he couldn't get anywhere through my house because the kitchen was the first place you had to go through. And one parent was always in the kitchen. It was like this, this rotating room. No matter what did you did to get into the house, there was a parent in the kitchen and there was no way past it. So <laughs> at the end of the day, there's not enough sun. You can't try anything <laughs> off. It's time to go in for dinner. And my father just looked up and said, are we safe from the river now? <laughs> you know. What's interesting is reading his stories years later, he was writing about me the whole time I grew up. The kids in his stor short stories kept on getting just a little older. And you can tell that he really respected the kid who went out and dug holes and stacked stones and built things. And, uh, you know, I kind, of, I kind of saw myself growing up, but later, I didn't read his books until after college, you know. I was busy. <laughs> so, so I have so many favorites in here. Man, um, I never know what to read. I'm going to read. Uh, so I'll, t I'll, I'll start with one which is kind of, uh, since it's a library, I feel I almost have to. This is from the chapter called Wood. Um, and many of my chapters kind of start off with some kind of profound statement <laughs> in my own mind uh, about something that relates to the subject. And in this case, <clears throat> it's about trees, which I still think are kind of amazing creatures. So this begins chapter six, Wood. Trees seem to be random, their arrival in fields and the top of hills unexplainable, their growth mysterious. It is hard to imagine the wood of trees while they stand, but inside there is something magical happening. The growth of trees is not repetitive, but additive, each year recorded in their flesh. Cut wood can be burnished like clay, polished to show its grain like stone, and on the shore, bleached driftwood looks like worn bone. Wood is known for how it burns more than for how it grows, but it is trees that most clearly mark time. The destruction of a tree by axe, rot, or fire is an assurance that memory is not intended to survive. Trees grow with us. One day, while we lived in Poolville, my family went for a drive. Poolville is a small upstate New York town that I lived in. There was no particular reason for it other than that my mother and father wanted to see the countryside in winter. My brother and I sat in the back of the station wagon as we drove out into the great white cold of central New York. It was before Christmas because there were still boxes of books in the back of the car my father had not yet donated to the library for the tax year. The car whistled as we went and always felt frigid in the back, the large empty bay incapable of holding any heat. The roads farthest in the village were plowed last, and my parents chose to drive onto one that had not yet been cleared, identifiable only by recent truck tracks and a row of skeletal maples lining its shoulder. We moved on the confidence my father had in the new snow tires he had bought. He relied on local wisdom for all mechanical matters and would quote mechanics as if they were philosophers. He'd grown up in Brooklyn and somehow maintained an urban perspective on the natural world despite his long tenure in rural territory. It had been little more than momentum that had kept us from being trapped by the deepening snow. The tracks we had followed turned off. My father hesitated, and the car slowed to a stop. They decided that they had seen enough, and my father tried to turn around. <laughs> the wheels spun and revealed the smooth ice below the snow. My mother offered advice, which was to gun the engine and lock in their seat. <laughs> my father got out and looked at the road as if something was wrong with it. I got out 
two, and we stood examining the polished ice and tire treads packed smooth with snow. Dave talked strategy. I suggested we use fallen branches from the maples as traction once you gather some. But I when I returned, an arm full of sticks, my father had already taken action. He had arranged his old book, open, packed in front of each tire. I was shocked. I thought my mother, a librarian, would never allow it. She sat in the front, far from town, resigned to accept forfeiture. I stood outside, still holding the sticks as my father got in and started the engine and hit the gas. The wheels stripped pages and threw them in a plume behind the car. A few were mangled, but many simply tore free and were thrown like large sheets of confetti. The paper did not look like snow and was noticeable on the road. One of the books was by Dickens, a duplicate that he had found in a box of books bought for a few dollars at an auction. My father got out and we looked at the pages blown over the snow. He could tell that I was horrified, but he smiled and said, Dickens would be proud to know that his book has been sacrificed to save little boys. <laughs> <laughs> we had watched A Christmas Carol that year, and I had seen Oliver in London. I guess that he was right. We were eventually rescued by a plow and honed a suit and lost confidence in snow tires. A farmer walking along his field in spring would find, spread along his fence, the pages of Dickens caught in the bark of the dry leaves. There's a lot in this book, obviously. Um, I haven't read anything from my, my many years and my boy in Maine Corp. Um, and I never know exactly what to read without reading the whole thing. Um, it's, there's some hard, dark matter in here. Um, maybe something from soil. Any other? You get a very different answer. <laughs> I went into construction. Yeah, yeah, you knock a wall down. I guess I could do a lot if I knock a wall down. But if I'm putting it up, you know, doing the trim. There's all those details. I like big things. Look at that. A wall's missing now. Huh? Huh? It really opens the place up, doesn't it? How about putting the trim on the windows? Oh. It's going to take me like weeks to. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not a, I'm great on the details when I draw something. Not so great on, uh, on the details in construction. Plus, I like to move by intuition. <laughs> <laughs> I like to build by intuition. Um, I don't know, I'll read this because I've never read it in public before. See, that's what I do. Open the book anywhere. I would read it from beginning to end, but because I'm not going to, I can do this. Mm -hmm. I have total license to do so. So um, 2003, uh, I was a light armor reconnaissance company commander in the invasion of Iraq before going back in 2005 uh, to Ramadi, which you may have seen on the news occasionally. There's never <coughs> good news from Ramadi, like ever. Um, I can feel myself focus. <laughs> know exactly what to read. Um, so I was there, and at the end, we were the last Marine unit in Iraq, guarding the 1st Marine Division headquarters, which was General Mattis, and the current, uh, current Marine Corps Commandant now, General Dunford, who was just his deputy ops. And <coughs> um, my, la my job was to guard Babylon. I was like, <laughs> I know. I wanted to be an archaeologist when I was a kid. So I'm like, just walking around the ruins of, ruins of Babylon, you know, surrounded by cuneiform, surrounded by Nebuchadnezzar's work, Alexander's work, put my tent where Al Alexander had died of, uh, of infection and, and um, probably disease after his India campaign. And that's where I was, king of Babylon for a couple months. 
uh, not that anyone cared. And um, I was surrounded by the wreckage of the oldest, most named city maybe ever. The place that is amazing that they actually had to find it again. Just like Rome. You know, Rome was under 90 feet of dirt when they rediscovered it. Like, oh, there, there's Rome. Like, what the hell happened between Rome and then? Like, everyone just forgot where it was? I was like, I, I don't understand how these things happen in history. Now you have the Islamic State blowing up everything that's left in the Middle East, which is, I, I can't even tell you how horrified I am by that. Not to mention that they kill a lot of people. Um, so this is me in Babylon. I'm not even sure what this part is, but I saw Babylon. So that's what you're going to get right now. It's from the, uh, from the chapter Soil, which is the combination of two original chapters that I was planning. One was dust, and the other was the underground. The underground really isn't an element, so it went into dust and became soil. Now you know how easily I think about things. The obvious occurs to me last, <laughs> and, uh, and so I proceed. The mounds of dirt around the exposed remains of Babylon were composed of the blown dust trapped in layers of pieces of pottery. There were pits dug in the undulations here and there made by either archaeologists doing test digs or by thieves burrowing into the fragments hoping to find something whole. In either case, the wounds cut into the ground were fascinating. One day I walked across the pocked field and found my way into one of the holes. It was 12 feet deep and showed no signs of having reached the floor of the ancient capital. The years had built up without noticeable delineation, all the clay shards and bone packed in the dirt appearing as one layer, one moment that lasted for a thousand years. I wondered if these mounds were simply everything that had been discarded by archaeologists excavating the Ishtar Gate and the walled interior of the citadel, French, Germans, and British fingering through shovelfuls of leavings and hauling all the common matter out to this field and dumping it all over again. All these shattered pots and bones of butchered animals, too ordinary to recompose, left in disorder, everything discarded. It seemed unlikely as, walking on them, the mounds formed geometric shapes. They were rounded squares dipped in their centers as if one thick layer of dirt had been draped over the walls of empty rooms. In one of the pits, I could see the bricks of a wall, cuneiform marked in them, the asphalt mortar still holding them in place. It was difficult to imagine the people pouring their trash into the empty section of cities for centuries after its decline, eventually filling buildings and covering their walls with the waste of later occupation. I found no skulls underground in the silt of the city, just jawbones and teeth of vanished flocks consumed. How was it possible that such immense places could be lost enough to require rediscovery? When Rome was finally unearthed, beginning in 1803, Many of its stone streets were under 60 feet of debris. How was it that no one noticed the dirt deepening, covering everything? Pompeii was entombed in a pyroclastic surge in AD 79 and lost until 1594 when a man dug it, found it digging an underground water channel. Sands massed over the tombs of Egyptian pharaohs. No one left to worry about their afterlives. Everyone buried slowly after them. The Acropolis left barren on its rock. The jungles grown over the temples of Machu Picchu and Ta Kram, Angkor. No one staying to guard the gates or leave fruit to the statues. All the gods and men worshipped, armies raised and bled away, taking empires and losing them, tombs filled with stolen treasures and looted, the seats of civilizations built and surrendered, all of us defending our homes and leaving them behind to be destroyed, the earth boiling up, dunes deepening, and water rising over our eternities. I stood in the pit looking at its walls. In some ways, it seemed appropriate that Iraq was now left with fragments, all that could not be reassembled, teeth and jaws, its histories broken down to unfamiliar objects symbolic of consumption instead of memory. You invade so many places in your life. You are a constant intruder, and you keep all the places you enter, and you let them all go. So I do that sometimes in Dust to Dust. Bam. Um, the book goes on. <laughs> it goes on and on. Um, uh, 
I was talking about poetry earlier today in a little, a little gathering of, of people here at the library, because of course the library would do that kind of thing. And uh, I talk about how sometimes I sneak a little bit of verse into prose. There's a little bit of it in that, and this little bit in this piece I'm going to read next. And uh, this will take you back to, uh, to childhood again um, in Poolville, where I was growing up. But it ends kind of strung together in that way that poetry usually is the only one that can get away with. But I try to sneak it in as prose. This is uh, in Ash. It was my chore to take out the metal bucket of ash my father carefully dug from our cast iron wood stove with a small shovel once a week. The ash had its own pile beside the compost, but both decreased in size as we added to them. I didn't think much about the ash as I carried it out into the snow. It looked like a crushed wasp's nest in a galvanized pail. I would dump it in the snow and watch as it melted its way to the older ash underneath. In the summer, I spent long days digging in the abandoned ash dumps that still held treasures around Poolville. Pieces of china dolls, glass medicine bottles, and the brittle lids from canning jars would emerge as I carefully excavated the household garbage. Most of them had already been discovered and dug hastily by two brothers. I was usually left to sift through what they had missed. The ash left iridescent tarnish on the bottles, but protected them in a soft, damp pile. I found marbles, chipped teacups, rusty razors, and porcelain doorknobs. I didn't consider what else was in the ash. The fires and stoves and horrors of the town had burned everything down. The forests that were now fields had emptied into the endless burning. Love letters, journals, books, underwear, the secrets of families went unto the fires along with newspapers, broken plates, and animal bones. They were all there in the ash that fell through my fingers as I searched for the objects that were still recognizable. <coughs> I remember making the trip with my father to the nearby college town of Hamilton for the newspapers. It was an adventure to see the landscape every time. In the winter, I wondered what lay covered under bumps in the snow. I imagined them to be ash dumps of vanished homesteads. Almost all the remaining houses along the road had firewood stacked in their porches and a trail of smoke from their chimneys. I could smell the wood burn through the vents of the car as we passed. I remember it clearly. The shadow of our car rippled as we moved, changed with the ground, flickering on the stalks of saplings, telephone poles, and fences. We were like soot on the snow, deformed but recognizable, a child's charcoal drawing of a station wagon. I can see myself, small, in the lit flame of the rear window as it expanded and shrank on the slopes with impossible suddenness, and my father in front, driving, changing size, both of us something enough to block the sun as we passed over the countryside late in the afternoon like a cloud of smoke that was known to us. I thought I got away with it. <laughs> uh, I'm going to take off my explosive jacket. What's that? You have a lot of It's poetic, Whew. I should say. <laughs> and in the process, really warm in that rhino. I loved your telling of when you took your bottle caps. Oh, I've got <laughs> bottle caps killed more people than I, my poor father. I have, you know, and it killed him too when he realized the immensity of it all. But uh, at the time, it was too late, you know. <coughs> Everyone kind of keys on the bottle caps part. Um, Oh, I should probably bring something more, something a little more with more levity. Uh, what time is it right now? <coughs> is, there, is everyone getting sleepy yet? <laughs> I'm the Energizer Bunny man. I can do this for days. I start in the beginning and just wipe you out. And once again, it's because of the construction of the book. I never remember where anything is in it. I really don't know what this part that I want to read is <laughs> like. What does, what, thematically, what does that fall under? Um, so I'm going to look for it for a second. Yeah, OK, this makes sense. <coughs> so I'll just do two pieces of this, um, because I kind of have to.
And I'll read one piece from the uh, from our core. Mm. Okay, so now I know where it is. <laughs> this is uh, this is blood. Not really. Um, and I'll just read two little sections from this <clears throat> to show you how I never learn anything. I don't learn a damn thing. I don't learn from injury. I don't learn from stupidity. I will repeat a bad idea with more enthusiasm for the rest of my life. So you went to OCS? Absolutely. Yeah, certainly. <laughs> I'm a perfect officer, right? We didn't run through that wall fast enough. That's why it didn't come down. Right. Try again. <laughs> I was always told away. Is it told, uh, this is the part I wrote in different languages. <laughs> so it reads strangely. I was always told to stay away from bees. The fact that they could hurt me only made them worthy of closer examination. Once, as a boy, I found a bumblebee living in a hole beside a barn, and I watched it come and go. I decided that it was a creature that I could capture, something I could outwit without injury despite its dangers. I was told to stay away from bees, wasps, and fire, but I believed that they only required secret scrutiny of the most cautious kind. The almost solitary habit of the, humble, uh, of the bumblebee removed me from the true fear of a swarm and I waited nearby with a minnow net for it to return. It was flying back and forth to a cluster of wild flocks, its legs thickened with bipollen, and it moved like a slow bullet toward me, its wings invisible with effort. I swung the net and knocked it down. It fell into the driveway, heavy enough to make a sound and an impression in the dust. It was stunned, but I thought it was dead. I did not know that a bee could be stunned. I had, a clean, I had a jar cleaned of its strawberry preserves and the tin lid still fragrant with fruit, and I carefully reached for a wing of the downed insect. I picked it up, examining it before placing it in my jar, and it awoke, <laughs> curled, stung my finger, and escaped as I retreated to the house. My hands were small then, and my finger quickly reddened with swelling. I had to admit that it hurt, that I was possibly at fault, <laughs> and that I required aid. These are all the things that I hated most. <laughs> my mother made a salve of baking soda and a wet towel, and I was told to hold it on my hand and rest. It took some time to feel better. Worse were the words she left me with. I was humbled with surprise, injury, and discovery. Now, what did we tell you about staying away from bees? <laughs> she never had to raise her voice. So we move forward. After Vassar, um, which I didn't complete exactly on time due to a credit, <laughs> admin was never really my thing. I was a digger. Um, I had to um, get another credit over the summer. So I stayed in the Poughkeepsie area. Didn't get my graduation uh, diploma, so I couldn't go into the Marines at the time until I had a four-year degree. And so um, I also didn't want to go home because that would re require a retreat of some kind and an admission that I had yet again been stung by a bee professionally <laughs> um, by my own faults. <laughs> so I, I, I worked out a deal where I, I did all the landscaping. I was a, st a stonemason. is a place I found that had all these stone walls that were just wreckage. And they had a condemned trailer. <laughs> and I moved into the condemned trailer just before winter after my senior year <clears throat> to finish my degree at night and to work all day. And so here I am. This is just outside of Poughkeepsie. In my leaking trailer after college, I cleaned the estate grounds in exchange for rent. I moved stacks of warped lumber, cracked plastic planting containers, parts of lawn mowers, and mossy cinder blocks. I stacked the piles of firewood into tight cords and planted a garden. The overgrown yard by the barn was raked and mowed. The last monumental piece of debris was a derelict Ford Bronco, baby blue, that my father had insisted on saving despite its worsening condition. It had been parked at the top of the hill beside the barn for years with a blue tarp draped over part of it, and it was full of wasps. <laughs>
<laughs> Should have read that. That part would have been great during the Britain section. <laughs> so here we are, big Ford Bronco with a blue tarp draped over it. It's full of wasps. <laughs> Does this sound like something you should just let, let live? Yeah. Be and let be? Yeah. But we know me die now, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> I see a bad idea. Let's rock. <laughs> so it was full of wasps that had converted the seats into hives. There was no money to tow it away, so I asked another tenant on the property if he could pull it to the top of the path down to the meadow with his pickup. We could then pull his pickup around behind the wreck, chain the rear of the Bronco to his truck, and ease it down the road out of sight by the gate at the bottom. It could still be towed away someday if the owners ever cared to do so. Everyone agreed to the plan, but someone would have to steer the Bronco. The steering fluid had drained out and the column was rusty, so small adjustments would take great effort. That was not the problem. <laughs> the problem was the wasps. The colony of yellow jackets and other things that settled in the Bronco was considerable. A crack in the loose driver's side door produced a steady flow of wasps, hundreds, and the truck could not even be approached on that side. When we pulled the tarp off, the entire truck vibrated with the hum of insects inside, and we had to back away quickly as they orbited the hood in search of the disturbance. I agreed to steer the truck. <laughs> I went into my trailer and put on three layers of sweatshirts, jeans, two layers of sweatpants, two pairs of socks, boots, a scarf, an extreme sports bike helmet that I had found at the Salvation Army, ski goggles, and winter gloves. It was July, <laughs> and I boiled in the density of inappropriate clothing. It was difficult to bend my arms and legs. There were no brakes anyway, so I figured there would be an unlikely requirement for dramatic steering. <laughs> So my immobility was of little concern. We looped the chain in the front, and I opened the door to an explosion of wasps. I sat in the seat, and I could feel the hive crush and stir through my clothes. The wasps hovered and dove at me, the compartment filled with them. It was like seeing molecules of gas heated. I almost felt that I had changed scale, become smaller, the wasps larger at this distance than they should be. I recall nothing of the short trip to the top of the hill except that I went there with every wasp on earth. The pickup pulled me slowly forward and then stopped. I had to assume we were near the top because I could barely see through the wasps on my goggles. I wiped them off with a glove. A log was wedged against the front tire and the chain removed. The pickup then took its new position behind me, the one man fastening the chain to the back and gave the thumbs up and another kicked away the log keeping the Bronco from rolling. Then they pushed. The Bronco crept forward, reaching the limit of the chain, which promptly lost its hook, slipped off the pickup, and began to rush, gaining speed as I fought the steering wheel to stay on the path. <laughs> the latch on the driver's side door was broken, and as the Bronco bounced on the ruts, the doors swung open, and the seat springs compressed and expanded like billows blowing out more wasps. <laughs> The hives swarmed like static around my face. All the far edge of the pasture was a small cliff, and it was approaching fast, the truck speeding as the limp door smashed into the lower gate of the meadow and slammed back into the cloud of wasps throwing glass over me. I was in the meadow now, pulling with all my might on the steering wheel to turn away from the cliff that dropped into the river. The door hung at an angle from a hinge, and I tumbled from the seat, covered by wasps as the truck hit a tree. I began to run, somehow sensing that my clothing was getting thinner as they stung into it. <laughs> and they would find a spot I had missed, something coming loose around my helmet and wasps pouring through a hole near my neck. I ran to the sound of three men laughing so hard <laughs> they were bent over and holding their knees. <laughs> <laughs> the lesson is, what did we tell you about staying away from bees? Um, any questions? What about your brother? Is he like you? Or? Not at all. <laughs> no, no. He played a lot of games and lived a very conventional life while I was in outer space. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <clears throat> there's barely anything in here about him in here because uh, this this violates a lot of stuff that people are used to in memoir, which is 
write the dirt about your family and life and surroundings and everybody else. Um, I didn't write about any of those people because I'm not in their head. I don't know what they're thinking. I don't know what they're seeing. And this is a singular perspective book. So if they were present, I say they were there. But I, if I remember something they said that's relevant, I'll write that they said it. But anything else is fiction, right? And I had very clear rules for myself about not, not making anything up. You know, it was, it was templated, it's stenciled from my memory, and we've talked about the corruption of memory anyway. But what I remember um, uh, is, is here. But everything else is just cut away. They're all, they're all people in, in orbit around me or I'm in orbit around them. You see a little bit of my parents because they were formative, powerful people in my life. And you need to know them before we lose them. You know, so, but everybody else, I think my brother's mentioned in there three times, and people are always like, why don't you write about your brother? I'm like, and what would I write? I was out there alone every day. I didn't play with him because he was throwing basketballs against the, the house or the, the barn while I was in the river. So what would I, what would I tell you? you know, what, what's missing from the book that you feel you need? Uh, if he writes one, I'll pass it on. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so no, th those people will become, you know, it's, it's not about them. It's about one, one view. If I can show you one perspective and do it as clearly as I can, that's what I'm trying to do. And really the intention behind these, these vignettes is this, the, many of these stories will make you think of something you did. You know, you might not have ridden a truck full of bees, but you probably poked something you weren't supposed to. You know, you, everyone's lived entire lives of, of curiosity. And if any of these things make you stop reading the book and go, you know, that reminds me of this time, then I win. I win every time you're not thinking about what I just did, but thinking about something that you did. And that was kind of this weird perspective, you know, the, the intentions of the book were kind of different than, than I guess most memoir is. Most memoir is, here's me, you know. And of course you get that because it's all I've got. It's, I only have one perspective, right? But it's really not entirely about me. I just want you to understand who the messenger is before the real messages come in the book. So you need to know that, that young Ben is a lunatic with certain urges he can't <laughs> control. And he's attracted to certain things in the world which he will continue to be attracted to for his whole life. When he looks at a stone, he's, wa he's watching stones since he could pick them up. There's a picture of me, actually, which I almost use in the, in the book, which is just me as a baby. <laughs> you know, one stone in my mouth and one stone in my hand <laughs> on a beach somewhere in Maine. And it's like, yeah, I, I would have tried to eat those. And then later I tried to stack them. 